There's a story in the canon where Mahabhajapati Gautami, the Buddha's stepmother, after ordination comes to see the Buddha and asks for a brief teaching that she can put into practice. And he gives her eight principles for testing what counts as genuine Dharma, genuine Ivinya. And the principles fall into three types. There are those that are related to the ultimate goal in the practice. There are those that are related to things we have to develop, qualities we have to develop within ourselves as we practice. And the third are qualities that have to do with our relationship with other people, how our practice has an impact on others. In each case, the Buddha says you see when you take on a particular dhamma, and here the word dhamma can mean a teaching or a mental quality or an action. And if it leads to a certain type of quality that's not in line with the dharma, then you know it's not really dharma. In other words, you test things through your actions. Now, in some cases, you can look at something and know where it's going to lead. In other cases, you have to give it a try. The ones having to do with the ultimate goal are True Dharma leads to being unfettered, and it leads to dispassion. And those two are very closely connected. Because when the Buddha talks about things that fetter the mind, passion plays a huge role. And this goes against the way a lot of us think. We like think that our passions are actually our expression of freedom, sensual passion. You think of all the different sensual desires that you might want to indulge in, or the sensual fantasies that you might want to create. And there's a lot of freedom there, you think. You have a whole range of sensual pleasures that you can think about and plan. And if you get tired of sensuality, then there, there's the pleasure of form. The mind is, it gets into concentration and it inhabits the body fully. That too is a, seems to be a type of freedom. And then there's the pleasure of formlessness. You can have a passion for formlessness when you've decided that even maintaining a sense of the form of the body becomes oppressive and you'd rather just be there with infinite space, infinite consciousness. It all seems very wide open and free. But the Buddha says there's a slavery there in the passion. It's a fetter. It keeps us tied to coming back again and again and again. The image he gives is of a yoke connecting two oxen. He says when there's a fetter between the eye and forms, is the eye the fetter of the forms, or the forms the fetter of the eye? Well, no. In the same way, when you have two oxen yoked together, is one ox the fetter of the other ox? No, the yoke is the ox. Excuse me, the yoke is the fetter, what ties them together, and it's the passion. A few years back, I remember hearing someone complaining about a, a Buddhist teacher. This was back in the 70s, 80s. Lots of young people were going to hear this particular teacher, and this person sat in on one of the classes this teacher offered, talked about how passion is the source of all our suffering. He looked around the room. He said, these are young people, they haven't really seen the passion of life yet. How can you be telling them that passion is bad? Well, the Buddha does approach the topic of passion strategically. You look at the duties of the Four Noble Truths. The duty with regard to the first, first truth, suffering, which is clinging to the aggregates. You have to comprehend that. And part of comprehension is getting past passion for them. The duty with regard to craving the cause of suffering is you've got to abandon it. Well, how do you abandon it? By developing dispassion. The Third Noble Truth itself is dispassion. It's when you get to the Fourth Noble Truth that you have to think strategically, because there's a lot you have to develop there. And without any passion, it's hard to develop virtue, hard to develop concentration, hard to develop discernment.
So you do concentrate your passion on the path. Of course, in that chant we have from the earlier Wangsika Sutta, you develop a passion for developing and a passion for abandoning. Developing skillful qualities, abandoning unskillful ones. You want to take your pleasure there. Make it your sport, shooting down your defilements when you see them. And trying to do a thorough job, as thorough a job as you can. It's only when the path is fully developed that you might think about well, what would be better than having to do the path with that. Getting to the goal would be better. But well, how do you do that? It's through dispassion. And we have a, for many of us, have a very negative notion of dispassion. It sounds like depression. It's not. It's more maturing. You might think of it as living in a village and getting involved in all the issues in the village of who likes whom and who doesn't like whom and who is mistreated whom, and all the back and forth of village life. And then you leave the village and you go into the wilderness. So you go up to the edge of the Grand Canyon, and just the vastness of the canyon makes you realize how small and petty all the affairs in the village were. It's similar to an image the Buddha himself uses. You get out into the wilderness, and you realize that all the concerns of people and all the concerns of the village just fade away. And the mind feels a lot more expansive. And that's dispassion. The mind, when it feels expansive, and it's not concerning itself with little tiny things. The Buddha did, tried to develop a taste of dispassion when he gave the graduated discourse. You think of all the good things and generosity, the good things and virtue, the rewards of those things. But then you start thinking about the drawbacks. You work hard to get sensual pleasures, and then they spoil you. As I said before, it's as if some sorrow were a sick joke. You work hard to get all these good things, and then as you enjoy them, it's bad for the mind. It pulls you back down. The Buddha says, when you can see that the drawbacks of that whole process, and see even that it's degrading. You're working hard and working hard and working hard for something that's going to let you down. If you can develop some dispassion for that, that's when you're ready for the Four Noble Truths and the duties of the Four Noble Truths. So think about the concerns you have as you go through the day, the things that you actually are passionate about. We tend to regard our passions with a lot of a lot of pride. But look at the things that the mind actually goes for. And then ask yourself, is that putting the mind in a position of freedom or is it putting it in a position of slavery? And you find that it's a slave to those activities. This is when you start thinking that it might be good to, as a first step, Develop some dispassion for sensuality and try to develop some passion for the pleasures of form and the pleasures of formlessness. In other words, get the mind into concentration. Look for your pleasures there. Knowing that someday you're going to have to go beyond these. But in the meantime, these are your tools for pulling away from sensual passion. Because as the Buddha said, if you don't have an alternative pleasure to sensuality, then no matter how much you may know about the drawbacks of sensuality, you're still going to go back to them, back to the sensual pleasures, back to, back to sensual thinking. So provide yourself with this pleasure of the concentration. Be passionate about this strategically. And when you do that, your practice is in line with the Dharma and Vinaya. That puts the mind in a position where it can look favorably on dispassion, favorably on being unfettered. As you look at life around you, 
pandemics, insane politics. I remember reading about a pandemic a century ago, and they were talking about how the government lied to people, and the whole thing got very politicized, and people died as a result. I remember reading about that at the beginning of the pandemic, our pandemic. And then you see the same things happening all over again. The Buddha's right. Samsara just goes around and around and around. And it never learns. It's like Tyler Rome's comment about the Bourbon family. They never forget, but they never learn. In other words, they remember old animosities, but they don't learn any maturity. And this is the world we keep coming back to. And so it's when you see dispassion as a good thing, it's when you're really on the path. The Buddha said, if you think that nirvana is something dull, or that it would have any, any bad qualities at all, then you've got wrong view. And it's going to hamper your practice. So learn to look on dispassion favorably as freedom, as being unfettered. And it'll give a real boost to your practice. <laughs>